make a brief introduction. Uh, professor Ishwar Prasad is a senior professor of trade policy at Cornell University and chair of international economics at Brookings Institute. He is also former head of uh, uh, China division at the IMF. Um, apart from the future of money, he has also published such well-received books as The Rise of the RMB, The Dollar Trap. Um, between these three books, I think we have much more than enough material to cover a whole hour. Unfortunately, we only have 40, 30 minutes. And we will make sure to leave about uh, eight or nine minutes towards the end for obviously questions from the audience. Um, if you could uh, um, each, when uh, uh, pointed, uh, just raise one brief question. We'll try to accommodate as many questions as possible. So, uh, Professor Prasad, thank you very much for uh, joining this session. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the book was published in 2021. It was one of the first mainstream uh, economists taking a systematic look at digital currencies as potentially uh, a replacement of physical money. The disappearance of physical money and the rise of uh, digital currency in the future. Um, well, a lot has happened since then. There are some, there's been some very dramatic ups and downs in the crypto market. Uh, some developments on um, central bank digital currencies that you are a big supporter of. Um, there are some sea changes in the regulatory environment. Uh, major governments have pursued very different policies. So could you lay out your key arguments from that book, as well as uh, any updates that you feel is necessary by now? A lot has happened indeed. Some good, not so good. And in my book, I try to think about what the digitization of money, which we are clearly in the midst of, might mean for money, for financial markets, and for the international monetary system. Now, when you think about money, what one might refer to its main functions are, it's really about transforming resources across space and across time. So once one thinks about how money accomplishes this, clearly the appearance of paper currency, which as it happened uh, was in China in the seventh century, was a remarkable transformation. The appearance of um, unbacked fiat currency under the regime of Kublai Khan, again in China in the 13th century, was a remarkable advance. But now we're at the cusp of physical currency essentially disappearing. Now the question is whether this actually leads to all the benefits that one might think of. Certainly, digital money in whatever form is more convenient for businesses, for consumers, for governments, because it pulls economic activity out of the shadows, reduces the use of central bank issued money for illicit purposes. But I think we're also at the cusp of a very interesting era of renewed competition between private and public currencies, but not in every function. If you think about the emergence of cryptocurrencies, decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin were meant to serve as mediums of exchange. And as we've learned, especially in the last uh, couple of years, they're not working that well as mediums of exchange. They're very volatile, very inefficient to use. But stable coins, especially fiat currency backed stable coins, are beginning to show that they can get traction as mediums of exchange. They can well compete with fiat currencies in that function, but the irony of stable coins, of course, is that they get their stable value precisely by being backed up by fiat currencies. So the necessity for institutionalized trust rather than decentralized trust still seems to be very important. So one can imagine competition between official and uh, private currencies in the medium of exchange function, but in terms of the store of value function, it still looks like fiat currencies issued by central banks with government standing behind them are still crucial. There is an interesting analogy in the international dimension as well. You spoke about central bank digital currencies, which certainly many countries around the world uh, are beginning to at least experiment with. Now, it happens to be the case that one can well imagine digital currencies of various sorts creating a lot of competition, even in the international sphere. But again, one can see potentially a digital renminbi somewhat incrementally increasing the use of the renminbi, but as a payments currency, as a reserve currency, I think there are still very important attributes in terms of financial market debt and liquidity, economic size and policies, but most importantly, the institutional framework, the rule of law, 
um, an independent system of checks and balances, um, an independent central bank, all of which are still very important. So the importance of institutionalized trust in this currency competition, both at the domestic level and at the international level, is something that I think has been unleashed by digital currencies. Now, what happens with cryptocurrencies is hard to tell, but I think the true legacy of the cryptocurrency revolution is going to be that it has shown us that there are enormous inefficiencies, pain points in the traditional financial markets that can be overcome with technology. Now, is technology going to be the entire solution? Regulators are clearly coming to the view that it is not. We need an institutionalized framework here too, in terms of a regulatory framework that can make sure that we create guardrails so that even cryptocurrencies, whether decentralized or centralized, can actually thrive and perform the functions that they were intended for. But the reality is that we are moving towards what I hope will be a more inclusive, more efficient financial system. We are not quite there yet in terms of delivering the benefits of the cryptocurrency revolution in terms of the democratization of finance. In fact, what we are seeing is a bit of a perversion, much more centralization. After all, stable coins are inherently centralized. We see much more centralization in terms of custodying and trading of assets. Think FTX and Binance. Um, and this is essentially importing all the fragilities of traditional financial markets into what was meant to be a decentralized uh, architecture. We're getting a lot more financial speculative activity, retail investors taking on risks that they should not be taking on. So the democratization promise still remains in the future. I'm hopeful we can get there, but there is a risk that we might go down a much darker path. All right. And I'm very happy to add that uh, uh, Professor Prasad's book, uh, The Future of Money, in 2021, it was published in 2021. And in that same year, it was uh, picked by uh, Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, where I also work as the best economic book of the year. And for Chinese readers of the book, uh, the first Chinese edition was published just a few months ago in China. So you're very welcome to check it out. Um, you mentioned uh, Binance and uh, 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 well, Coinbase too these days, uh, very much in the news. Uh, those of us in China, this reminds us very much of a strike hard campaign uh, in the US where uh, the government is going very forcefully against uh, these top uh, crypto exchanges. On the other hand, in this part of the world, Singapore and Hong Kong in recent years have embraced these uh, uh, crypto um, innovators and uh, some of the world's biggest uh, exchanges. How do you think uh, these differing attitudes in regulation is going to affect the, lands, the global landscape for um, crypto and for digital currencies uh, in general? Now, decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, in my view, have become largely speculative financial assets. When I think about what the underlying valuation model is behind Bitcoin, you know, it doesn't serve an intrinsic purpose is a medium of exchange, so the value seems to be largely attributable to scarcity, which seems a more dubious source of value in and of itself. Um, we are seeing stable coins get traction precisely because they are fulfilling the need for better payments, both domestically um, and <coughs> cross-border. But I think regulators are concerned from a variety of different perspectives. One is about the risk of centralization, as I mentioned, we seem to have a lot of power being accreted among the major exchanges which are undertaking the functions of custodying of these assets, trading of assets, without necessarily hewing to the rules that any traditional exchange or custodian needs to fulfill. So that is a set of concerns. There are recent concerns, somewhat ironically, because of failures in the traditional financial system, think Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank, that are making regulators concerned even about stable coins. A concern I often hear among regulators in Washington is that if there were to be a redemption run on a stable coin, that could mean that the collateral in the form of treasury securities has to be sold by the stable coin issuer, which could potentially cause problems in the underlying treasury securities market, which could spill over into other markets. So the risk of spillovers into the traditional financial system is a concern. And then there is a concern about investor protection. Now, we have seen that um, the cryptocurrency market lost about 
2 trillion dollars worth in valuation and it didn't seem to create any major stir in the financial system either in the US and in other countries. So one might argue that there does seem to be a separation between the two that one should just leave cryptocurrencies to themselves, let buyers beware. But I think regulators are increasingly concerned about these spillover risks and the investor protection issues that they feel have not been adequately addressed. And you're correct that there is this bifurcation that is appearing among the larger jurisdictions that are taking a much more restrictive approach to cryptocurrencies and even to the technology at some level. And in other economies, Hong Kong, um, uh, and I was just in um, uh, Zurich uh, where there was a conference set up by um, the Swiss National Bank and the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore where they were talking about the benefits of these technology in terms of providing easier access to payment systems, to financial products and services. So the separation between the technology and the asset part of uh, the cryptocurrency world, I think is going to essentially be mandated by regulations. And there is a risk that we end up in a space where we, rather than having more decentralization, regulation often ends up serving as a barrier to entry. So we could end up paradoxically with regulation creating a little more safety, but once again creating even more power among incumbents, creating even more centralization, and then leaving us with exactly all of the uh, points of failure that we have in traditional financial markets. So again, I hope that we will not get to that stage, but there is a risk that we do. Right. Um, earlier, I mentioned to you a recent survey um, done by Tencent and the Chinese government agency of uh, some of the world's best educated young professionals and students about their impressions of China, today's China. Uh, very interestingly, they ranked ubiquitous QR code payment, e-commerce, and high-speed rail as their most impressed points about China. Right up there, and only under those are the Great Wall and uh, giant pandas. <laughs> so, um, and it seems it's not just on crypto or, or stable coins or other forms of fintech. Uh, Asian economies, developing economies, even some small island economies are much more aggressive, much more progressive about embracing new uh, um, digital payment technologies and fintech in general. Um, how do you think that is going to affect the landscape of uh, money of the future? You certainly, digital payments are becoming pervasive and China was well ahead of the game in this dimension. In India, you have the unified payments interface that is working remarkably well. And that links up with an earlier question that you asked about uh, my view on central bank digital currencies, uh, retail CBDCs in particular that would displace, um, in principle, um, cash. My view has become a little more nuanced since I handed in the manuscript for my book in early 2021. Um, what we see is that in many of the countries that have gone forward with CBDC, retail CBDC experiments, this includes China, Sweden, India, Brazil, Japan, Paradoxically, these are all countries where the domestic retail payments are working very efficiently. So the user case for a retail CBDC has, if anything, become a little weaker over the last uh, couple of years because it seems like there are much better ways for the private sector to conduct exactly the sort of payment transactions that you could, in principle, do with a CBDC. In terms of broadening financial inclusion, again, the UPI in India is working perfectly well in terms of delivering that objective. So the question is, why bother with the CBDC? Now, central banks that I, bankers that I speak to suggest that there are still um, some motivations at play. For instance, in China, Alipay and WeChat Pay don't exactly communicate directly with each other. So a CBDC could uh, get us to a world where we have interoperability across payment systems. Then you think about payment system resilience that could be ensured by a public payment option, that is helpful as well. And then many central bankers also talk about monetary sovereignty, the notion that if a central bank stops issuing a currency, it affects the way that money is perceived. This seems a little um, you know, uh, sketchy to think about it in these um, more abstract terms, which central bankers normally don't, uh, but it seems to be an important determinant. But whatever happens with retail CBDC and the user case, I think the one element where there is clearly a strong user case is in that of wholesale CBDC or multiple CBDC bridges that allow for more efficient cross-border payments. 
Now there again, there was a huge pain point in traditional finance because cross-border payments, as we all uh, know, are very costly, um, slow to execute, difficult to track in real time. And here again, the new technologies essentially catalyzed by the cryptocurrency revolution have shown us there is a better, more efficient way to do this, much more seamlessly, practically in real time. And this is going to have real benefits in terms of trade and financial transactions being settled cross-border practically instantaneously, reducing the need for hedging. It's going to make it much easier for economic migrants sending remittances back to their home countries. And the number of central banks around the world engaged in these um, uh, initiatives to integrate their wholesale CBDCs, I think does portend a better world in terms of international payments. But as with anything else, there is a but. It comes with some risks. For the large jurisdictions, it doesn't matter that much. But for many emerging market and developing countries, I think there could be existential concerns for their uh, currencies. If you have stable coins easily and widely available, um, or even if you have a digital renminbi or a digital dollar easily available for smaller countries, countries with currencies or central banks that are not credible, currency substitution becomes a real concern. Likewise, the more conduits there are for capital to flow because it's less uh, bound by frictions, the more capital flow volatility, the more exchange rate volatility that you could have. So once again, one could see a bifurcation in terms of the benefits of these new technologies being harnessed much more effectively by the large economies and the small economies. But at the same time, there are lots of benefits in terms of financial inclusion, digital payments, um, improving efficiency of economic systems, even in developing countries. So I think overall, on net, these are beneficial changes. Right. Um, an elephant in the room, and as well as a central thread that runs through all three of your recent books, is about uh, well, the dominance of the dollar and uh, its uh, endless line of new or old challengers. Um, your consistent argument was that despite all of the challenges, the US dollar is going to remain the dominant one, although um, there are many other competitors chipping away uh, on the edges. Um, again, recent developments, um, global inflationary uh, pressure, um, crises from uh, Silicon Valley Bank, from uh, Credit Suisse, all of these uh, uh, currency swap programs between China and other major developing economies and trade partners, as well as uh, um, supply chain and financial decoupling or de-risking, whatever you call it. Um, how has that attributed to any new thought potentially on this argument of yours? You brought pandas and elephants into the room and now the US eagle as well. Um, it's hard to see a substantial um, change in the international monetary system, although I would preface my remarks by saying that it's far from obvious that the current financial system that we have is a good one, where one currency is so dominant and the effects of the central bank that issues that currency reverberate in every corner of the world. I don't think this is a very balanced uh, uh, situation in the international monetary system. Now, the reality is that as we move towards um, other forms of digital currencies, Perhaps we'll ha we will have more currency competition. But hewing to my earlier remarks, um, I want to make the case that even if there were to be a digital renminbi um, well before there ever is a digital dollar, is it going to fundamentally alter the dynamics of international finance? If you think about international payments, practically all of them are digital already. So just the fact that you have a digital renminbi available isn't going to fundamentally alter that. China's cross-border interbank payment system, SIPs on the other hand, could be a much more important game changer. It can directly communicate with the payment systems of other countries. It can even act as a messaging system that allows countries to get around uh, the need to message through the SWIFT uh, network. Um, if there were mature payment systems in other countries that could directly communicate with SIPs, then you could see a lot more trade being conducted directly between emerging market currency pairs. Right now, it's very difficult to trade bilaterally between those currency pairs because it's costly. There isn't much liquidity in those markets. But if you get practically instantaneous settlement of those transactions, that becomes feasible. So one can see the dollar's role as a payment currency or as a vehicle currency between different currency pairs becoming somewhat less important over time. But at the same time, if you think about stable coins becoming more important, it's likely, and in fact, so far the evidence is pretty clear, 
that it is US dollar backed stable coins that seem to be gaining the most traction. So somewhat paradoxically and indirectly, the dollar might become even more dominant in terms of international payments. As a reserve currency, as I argued, you need very deep and liquid financial markets. And while the US is issuing huge amounts of debt, with uh, the gross federal debt to GDP well over 130% uh, of GDP right now, which is a staggering number, that's a lot of depth and liquidity in that market, which seems to favor the US. And the US institutional framework really got chipped away, especially during the previous administration, and it continues to some extent um, uh, at the moment. But if you take this combination of uh, um, factors, the US still seems to be in a dominant position. I can well see the renminbi gaining a little more traction as a payment currency, perhaps even as a reserve currency, as reserve managers around the world look for diversification opportunities. But one curious phenomenon has started showing up in, in the international financial system in the last seven or eight years. Yes, the dollar share as a reserve currency has fallen by about a couple of percentage points, but the euro share has fallen even more. So somewhat interestingly, the distance between the dollar and the second most important reserve currency has in fact increased. And now I think we're going to get into a situation of fragmentation where there is a sort of you know, intense competition between the second tier currencies in which I'm going to include for now the euro, the Japanese yen, the pound sterling, and the Chinese renminbi and other emerging market currencies. So I can see the dollar perhaps losing some of its dominance as a payment currency, as a reserve currency, but it will still remain by far the most important one, while you have a whole range of other currencies beginning to battle it out between each other and perhaps leave the dollar at some level even more dominant because it has no serious rival. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Prasad, for this clear-eyed analysis and uh, roadmap. Um, I think we'll leave um, the rest of uh, our eight or nine minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, thanks. I, I want to build on a first question and ask about RMB situation. Um, so, uh, which, uh, after the sanction last year and uh, Fed aggressively raising interest rate, uh, RMB internationalization seems to gain some attraction. Uh, what we see uh, is some international investors starting to show some interest, especially for this uh, Swap Connect launched uh, two months ago. The daily trading volume is uh, several billion RMB. Uh, but for the RMB counter, essentially using RMB to buy Hong Kong stocks, which is Chinese company essentially, the daily trading volume is only um, several hundred million RMB. So that's... Uh, so in essence, is RMB internationalization, the constraints it is still uh, the fundamentals of uh, Chinese economy, people's confidence uh, in the Chinese companies and the institutions, as you mentioned. So renminbi internationalization, I think, is being held back by um, the difficulty in getting access to renminbi liquidity in offshore markets. And that, of course, comes to a broader range of policies, especially related to the capital account. It's hard to see a currency playing a major role um, as a payment currency and especially as a reserve currency um, if it remains bound by significant restrictions on the capital account. Now, having said that, China has opened up its bond and equity markets to foreign investors um, through a variety of schemes uh, like the Stock Connect, the Bond Fund, Mutual Fund Connect, and the Qualified Foreign Institutional Investor Scheme. But all of those uh, schemes have expanded such that there's practically unrestricted access right now. That leaves other questions on the table, the Chinese macroeconomic environment and confidence in the Chinese policy making and institutional apparatus. So in the past, uh, in the recent past, you know, China has used capital account policies as a way of managing the exchange rate. When there are significant downward pressures on the renminbi in 2014, 2015, as we saw, China tightened up on the capital account. And if foreign investors feel that policies that are being undertaken now can be reversed, that's a concern. And then, of course, there is the institutional environment. There is a question whether foreign investors, while they may look to China for return and diversification, will really view it as an investor, as something that they can trust uh, as a safe asset, one that they can turn to in troubled times. And that, I think, will require significant institutional development in China. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a second question from the gentleman in the front, and then a third one from the gentleman in the back. Uh, then we'll see. Sorry. 
I'm Randolph Kappa from uh, the Trade and Development Bank in Mongolia. Uh, the first day of this conference, I was just thinking, represented the 57th anniversary of my start of the start of my banking career. So I'm reminded of the story that old bankers never die; they just lose interest. So the question I have about stable coins is, are they paying interest? Because part of the whole value of, uh, uh, part of the definition of money is the store of value, uh, which means you can, by having it, you might be able to earn, earn something on it. And I don't see that too much in the equation. If, if stable coins are to be backed by dollars, then there's a parity effectively with the dollar. Yeah, so one can if think about... If they're not, then it's a, it's a play on the two, uh, the two economies and the trust and inflation rate and interest rate differentials. Yeah, one can think about stable coins as essentially, you know, digitizations of fiat currency. And there is an interesting question that's coming up now about how one thinks about um, uh, the competition between three types of digitized money, tokenized uh, bank deposits, um, stable coins, and CBDCs. Can one see a world in which the three coexist? And I think the three of them can play different functions and they all liabilities of different uh, um, institutions and therefore they have different characteristics. Um, but stable coins are, um, you know, playing in a particularly uh, odd niche because you're right that they are essentially taking um, digitized versions of fiat currency and turning those into what look to some extent like securities. But I think there is a world in which stable coins with their programmability can play a role in decentralized finance tokenized deposits can keep the banks playing an important role in payment architectures, and we can have, um, uh, you know, CBDCs filling in some of these gaps. Maybe we should take questions from the two ladies who are trying very hard to get their attention. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, and then. I'll take both of those, and right. then I can... Um, right, right. Yes? Yeah. Hi, nice to meet you. Narena Global Shaper. I have uh, two questions. The first uh, is that I read a lot about uh, the possibility of a unique CBDC. That's even possible. And the second is, if CBDC are exchangeable each other, what is going to happen to SWIFT and how we are going to unify that exchange? Thank okay. you. Should we take one more and then I can... Thanks for a very informative presentation. Uh, I'm Tara from the IMF. Uh, so I just had a couple of uh, questions. The first is, uh, what risks do you see to monetary policy frameworks just very broadly in terms of the major risks? And the second, uh, you know, over 100 countries are sort of in the process of, uh, you know, implementing or thinking, thinking about CBDCs. So what role do you sort of see for governments? Because obviously if you have public money that is on a ledger, then the data is going to be accessible to the central banks. So, so what trade-offs do you see over there? Thanks. Okay. Uh, so both are uh, connected. So if you mean by a uh, unique CBDC, uh, a worldwide um, CBDC, that seems quite unlikely. I think we are not going to have a unification of money across um, countries. And ultimately, and this goes to the other question as well, um, money, whether it is provided in physical form or digital form, the value placed on it, the trust placed in it, really depends on how trustworthy the institution that is issuing it is seen as. So if you have um, you know, an incapable and non-credible central bank issuing digital currency, that by itself is not going to transform um, how credible um, that money is going to be. And CBDCs by themselves, again, are not going to um, displace any of the existing cross-border payment systems unless we think about um, multiple uh, or cross-border CBDCs at the wholesale level. Those could play an effect, um, and as I mentioned, um, the Chinese cross-border interbank payment system um, provides one template in which you could have messaging tied in with the payment and settlement function rather than having an institution like SWIFT, which had a business model that was clearly vulnerable to, um, uh, to technological disruption. What effect will all of this have on monetary policy? Now, that's an interesting question. If you think about stable coins, they're not creating an independent source of money. But if stable coins, if the existence of CBDCs undermines commercial banks, then we potentially have a problem. Because, you know, in modern economies, central banks are not creating the most money. It is commercial banks. So if we have a situation about deposit intermediation from uh, um, commercial banks, that poses a pretty serious risk. Um, what role other types of payment mechanisms and non-traditional financial institutions play in finance will also affect the transmission and also the implementation of monetary policy. 
and the one